Okay, awesome. So my name is Taylor Simone. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm calling in from the indigenous land of the Kikapu peoples in the United States. And I'm an international network coordinator. What that means is that I support noise, working groups, individual members, and also people that just are interested in learning more about the network that looks different from day to day. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hey everyone, my name is Victoria. Uh, I have the same role as Taylor, but I'm based in Toronto. Um, and I also work as a freelance graphic and web designer, and I'm on the territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, um, Mississauga, and the Huron Wendat. Okay, cool. Thank you, Victoria. Victoria's going to be helping out uh, with the chat, posting resources as we go along. So if you're looking for a link or where to find something, you can check there. So the first thing we're going to go over is just like why we do these sessions. Um, we created these sessions just as a way to offer better support for new members and signatories and people that are interested in learning more about design justice and the principles. So this offers space for us to have dialogue, ask questions, but also to get feedback and ideas from people who are new members that may um, just like have suggestions for how to welcome members into the network. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what design justice is. I'm going to give a very brief overview of what this concept is. We do strongly suggest to anyone who's new to the network to check out design justice, community-led practices to build the world we need. Um, that really goes over the foundational elements of design justice. And there's also information on designjustice.org that you can check out as well. So getting into the framework of that design justice. So design justice is a framework for analysis of how uh, the design of socio-technical systems influence distribution and of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. So when we're thinking about like the philosophy of design justice, we've really been influenced by a lot of amazing, uh, amazing movements, grassroots organizations and research. So just for example, Black Feminist Thought by Kimberly Crenshaw um, gave us a lot of insight on intersectionality when it comes to design justice. Patricia Hill Collins' work on the matrix of domination was also fundamental to the book that we showed you and is referenced in that book as well. Um, there is a link on the slide to find the book from a, um, a couple slides ago and Victoria will share that in the chat. So when you're thinking about design justice, one of the things that we're really thinking about is the process of how design happens. So usually design processes tend to centralize those who already have the most power with others being on the periphery of the process. So here on the slide, it shows a black circle that reads design process, three pink circles that represent those who are most powerful, and then circles on the outside that are blue of those people who have less power in the decision-making process. And when we started thinking about this process, um, we actually moved through a workshop and we still use these three questions as like a basis or a compass for navigating uh, spaces, but who was involved in the process, who benefited and who was harmed. Um, fundamentally, design justice is about the distribution of benefits and harms, um, distributive justice, and also procedural justice. So on this chart, it reads benefits in the center and then it has one arrow going to less powerful, a black circle that says that and a few more arrows going to the more powerful. So in conventional design processes, the benefits tend to flow to those who are most po already powerful in society or most powerful in society. Um, there's this giant overarching process we're talking about in terms of procedural just justice and creating a thing. So we're thinking about the whole system that goes into creating a thing or an idea. And we can think about this in terms of like a system being inequitable. So a CEO that's making high level strategy about the decisions of how people are gonna work, about how uh, things are gonna get built has way more equity than someone who is actually impacted by those decisions. So a worker who's manufacturing the product or a community that sits in relation to 
for example, like a, a factory that's manufacturing a product or a thing or an idea. And then we flip this when we're thinking about harm. So again, like for this example, harm is in the middle and it's red. There are a lot of arrows going towards less powerful and one arrow going towards the most powerful. So again, um, the harm tends to fall most likely on those who are already marginalized. And you can look at that from a couple of aspects. So like community members, users that are engaging with the product and also workers who help to contribute to the production of that thing. So when we're thinking about design justice, we're thinking about the expansion of that process and that idea to really expand and center the knowledge and lived experiences of the communities who are impacted the most through that process. So in this chart, just to explain, there's design process in the middle, there's an expanded black circle with a gradient and it includes all of the dots. So those who are typically marginalized are centered in the process and those that have less power are kind of on the periphery, but still within the process. So design justice is a growing community. We focus on meaningful participation in design decisions. And we also focus on the recognition of community-based indigenous and diasporic design traditions, knowledge and practices. One of the things that we ask, and this is actually one of our principles, is just the idea of looking for information that's already there and not assuming that we have solutions that communities may already have themselves. Um, and another thing is just distribution of benefits and burdens to these communities and people. So that was kind of a general overview of the process. Um, like I said, there's much more resources on the website and we'll have time for questions and answers and things like that. So um, the Design Justice Network was born at the AMC in the summer of 2015. This was before it was actually conceptualized as a network, a group of 30 designers, artists, technologists and community organizers met to participate in a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. And the goal of this workshop was to really challenge uh, the framework and to move beyond the framework of social impact design and designing for good. Um, and a part of that the intention of challenging was to just look at that or to consider the idea that design processes and practices um, that don't that have good intentions but don't necessarily um, incorporate community members into the process may not be liberatory tools or may not end up being liberatory tools. So at this workshop, um, they created the bulk of the principles, like so the base or the foundation of the principles. And they're really looking at these two ideas. So design justice is, and then what do we do this by? So for example, design justice is designing with instead of designing for, becoming a part of the community. We do this by engaging our full selves, learning and teaching studios. And from that, um, the principles kind of sat for a year. There was organizing around it, but at the next Allied Media Conference in Detroit in 2016, another group of designers and artists and community organizers met. This was the first network gathering for uh, the network. And we worked together to revise the principles. So it was a pretty straightforward process of actually making direct edits um, to the principles and allowing everyone to come in and contribute to that process. Um, and from there, we got together and discussed what these changes meant, how they impact the principles that were presented, um, and how they expand upon concepts that may have been missed. And then there are also workshops like in between this that really contextualize the way that design justice can be implemented. Um, So the following year at the AMC, so this is 2017, um, the principles were officially launched. We have 10 principles for the network. Um, that's not necessarily a hard rule as we get more translations for the principles. For, exa for example, Hindustani, um, our principal translations in that language have 11 principles because of the local context that they're um, challenging. 
And then another thing to note is that as these gatherings were happening, there were also resources being created that kind of correspond with the growth of the network. So these are the first three scenes that were produced. They are available at designdistance.org slash zines, um, and they're available for free download. Um, we do usually sell copies of this, um, and we're out right now, but we'll let the network know when we have them. So moving past kind of like the history of the network or short history of the network, um, I wanna just talk about the DJM structure really quickly. So if you think about the DJM structure as a circle, you'll see signatories kind of on the outside of an inner circle. Um, so signatories are people that have signed on to the principles. They are dedicated to learning more, dedicated to incorporating it into their practices. Um, and, and that's their level of commitment to the network. Members are those who just take a next step as far as involvement goes. They may participate in the three circles in the middle, working groups, local noise, or the steering committee, or they may just want to have more opportunity to connect with fellow practitioners in design justice, like through our member Slack and things like that. Um, the steering committee is a group of individuals who have had a long um, history of involvement, and volunteer work within the network. They work together um, with the input of the network to really make decisions. Uh, the local noise are groups that come together. They're members who just volunteer to coordinate and those are organized around local contacts. So we have local noise for cities, regions and continents. It really just depends. Um, and then working groups. Working groups are groups of volunteers that centralize around a certain topic. So we have our instructional design working group, for example, and that's what they focus on. So a question we get a lot is just how do you join the network? You can sign on again to design justice principles on our website. We have over 2000 signatories right now. We try to update the signatories list on a bi-monthly basis. It is a manual process for us. So if you haven't seen your name on there yet, you will see your name. Um, and then the next step is just to become a member. So we do have a paid membership. Um, it's a sliding scale of what you can afford to donate. And there are certain benefits for membership, like access to the Slack channel, access to our listserv, where you can um, email members to organize around certain topics, get opinions, um, and also invitations to our member stories. So these happen periodically where we highlight or spotlight a member, and they talk about a project that they're working on and how they're not only um, incorporating the principles, but challenges that they may have and things like that. And then one of the last things listed is just the DJ and care circle. So the DJ and care circle is a virtual seasonal series of care practices for design justice practitioners. It's really centered around restorative practices, healing and just check-ins because um, this work is hard and we know that. Um, there is an event coming up for members on April 30th where they'll be doing vision boardings with a healing practitioner um, from Healing by Choice in Detroit. Okay, cool. So I mentioned at the beginning of this process that um, around the time the network was starting, we were inspired by a lot of grassroots organizations. So like the Allied Media Conference is a space for grassroots organizations. So we were surrounded by um, this like level of excitement and creating and rethinking processes. And there are lots of organizations out there that are doing work that is aligned with the design justice principles in some way. So Black Women Flourish, Design is Protest, the American Institute of Architects, the Digital Justice Lab, FemTechNet, Intelligent Mischief, the Algorithmic uh, Justice League. And that's just to name a few. A lot of our members are doing amazing work on their own and are part of collectives and projects um, that we're seeing all the time that I shared on Slack. Just for transparency, we do like to be transparent with our finances. Um, we do release member reports that kind of show where finances are going and that's been kind of on like a biannual basis. So there are four main sources for our income, our membership fees, 
which like I said, is what you can afford on a sliding scale, but you can also donate monthly, yearly, or you can do one-time donations. So we do sell also merch and publications. Um, we do workshops and talks. So if people come to us about um, working on projects and really re-educating or reteaching certain design processes. And we take those on, we used to get honorarium, honorariums for them. A lot of times the steering committee um, does these talks. Me and Victoria will do these talks. And um, we have also offered them to members that we know are in a local context uh, and would have more of a knowledge base for certain topics. And then we have our individual contributors. So those are the one-time donations. And you can actually learn more about our finances on our website. So um, we learn a lot about our members from events like this, when people meet. Um, becoming a member through paid sponsorship just helps ensure that, uh, first off, that we're in community with each other and that we're able to access these threads of communication through Slack and the listserv, um, that everyone is in alignment with the design justice principles and that uh, everybody is in a space of care and safety. We really look at that Slack as a space of safety and kind of like, I wanna say a line of defense, but a place where we can safely hold each other accountable as well. So design just as an action. Um, a lot of times people want to see examples of how people are using design justice principles. We position the principles as a practice oftentimes. So it's something that you're revisiting and coming back to and really using as a compass or a tool for alignment. So we do have DJM member spotlights, which are great resources for getting to know members. Um, and they extend from like social work to technologists to educators. We kind of have a large diverse breadth of like types of work that we're doing in the network. And those are available on our website as well. We do member story sessions and we have recordings of those on our YouTube channel. So um, design just as an action really quickly. I just want to talk about the working groups a little bit more. So our working groups, again, are places where people focus on specific topics. So we have uh, DJN principles at work. They focus on professionalized resources and ways to navigate professionalized spaces and the challenges that come with that, especially when you're the one trying to incorporate or read, teach or do things like that in that space. So they have zines, workshops, and different like group assessments and check-ins. There's also a sub group within that um, working group, a zine group. They are producing a zine on neurodivergence right now. And they have one more coming down the line. And then there's our communications group. So that's social media podcasting and our monthly newsletter. We haven't updated this because it was just announced that we have an instructional design working group. So they are focusing on the design of curriculum, teaching materials, and things like that. Um, so our local noise, we have noise all over the world and we encourage the creation of noise. It's a pretty straightforward process. Me and Victoria are always here to help out with that process and to support and to connect members that may be interested. So um, just to reiterate again, local noids are groups that volunteer based on their local context and ge geography. Um, and the zine like page on our website, there is a really informative zine called Design Justice Local Noids. It walks you through step-by-step -step the process of what you're going through um, or what you're gonna go through for application. And it was created by, or it was a collaborative process between members. Okay, volunteer opportunities for the network. Um, there are a couple volunteer opportunities for the network. One is DJ and writing. So we encourage members to go to events and write reports on those events, um, to take up social con media content if they want to, and also note taking at events, doing things around accessibility has been a big help to the network. We also have many translations of the principles and we encourage groups of people, two or three to get together to do this. Um, and we center those, that project or those projects around really considering local context. So again, for example, the Hindustani principles have 11 principles instead of 10. 
Um, and yeah, we're always open to other ideas of work that you want to see in the network or work that you feel you have the capacity to do. So here are some of the ways that the Design Justice Network has been impactful. We do get a lot of invitations from different committees, organizations to educate on design, but more often re-educate about design processes. Um, we work with people on just integrating design justice within their practices. NOIDs are always doing local workshops, book clubs, and things of that nature. Um, there are projects, well, our members are all doing amazing projects um, that really have a large impact when it comes to like a collective view of the design practitioners um, in our network. And then we also have organizations that have signed onto the principles. Um, we do resources around the principles and yeah, our membership growth. And then we do have room for growth in the network. Um, just considering like the timeline of our network, we still do consider our network a pretty young one. Um, so we acknowledge that there is room for growth and like rethinking like what it means to volunteer and offer like labor to the network. Um, people are distributed around the world. So we are still working through like ways to kind of grasp or not grasp, but ways to really represent that internationality and um, new involving structures on decision-making and process processes. We're always looking to lean towards a more democratized way of thinking about decisions and processes. And that's been something that's been growing um, with capacity. And then there's organizing activities, more activities for the principals and things like that. So um, this is a recent update for the network. In 2020, the steering committee well, at the time, I don't know if they were the steering committee yet, um, but they realized they had launched the principles and got all these new members and the growth was like exponential within that timeline. And they realized they didn't have, uh, they have the principles that didn't have a mission or vision for the network itself. So in 2020, they started a, let's say a year long process of really diving into intentional work to figure out the mission envision for the network and we just launched the mission and vision in December. You can read more about that process on the website. Um, yeah, and these are just links to become signatories and become members. So cool. That